Okay, everyone, we'll make a start. So my name is Jo Thompson. I'm a consultant for HR Recruit. And today's boardroom is Resilience in the Current Climate that is being facilitated by Debbie Stanford. So without further ado, I shall pass you over to Debbie and she can introduce the session. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Debbie Stanford. I will um, share my screen with you straight away, but I will continue to chat. Um, if you're wondering who I am, I recognise a few faces from a session I did a couple of weeks ago, which was on coaching. Um, today, we're looking at resilience in the current climate. And um, I'm probably taking a different, a different tact to what you've probably seen before. So probably what you've, what you've heard or seen before is around, um, please take exercise, um, eat healthily, get outside more. And I'm not advocating that any of those are a bad idea. I wholeheartedly agree with them all. But for me, resilience starts with mindset. So it's very much around if you think about, I don't know, you've got a toothache and um, you decide to take some ibuprofen, all you're doing is numbing the pain, but there's still a root cause. So my thought process today and everything that I do around resilience is let's get your thinking online in combination with eating healthily, getting outside, exercising, whatever else you might do. But actually, if you don't start with this, then your results aren't going to be as good. You're just temporarily fixing things. So that's the theme for today. Hopefully you're in the right room. If you're not, don't worry. You can exit stage left. That's absolutely fine. Um, and just a little bit about me, if you don't know anything about me, Debbie Stanford, I've been a trainer for 25 years. Um, I particularly love um, you know, what I do. I don't ever feel like I go to work. I do anything from one-to-one -one coaching. And as I was just talking with uh, Joe just a moment ago, I'm walking coaching this afternoon after this session. So I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Um, up to guest speaking, to um, leadership programs, lots of insights, um, you know, insights discovery um, and lots of other things. And we'll talk about that more later. But probably the most that I am asked to deliver at the moment is around resilience in the current climate. So this is um, very much around uh, stuff that I feel is current at the moment. Really hard to pick out um, a selection of things when I want to tell you everything. So um, I've picked out a selection of stuff and um, there will be an opportunity to speak with me afterwards if you want to as well. So let's go, let's carry on from here. So the objectives today, um, ladies and gents, are we are going to identify where you are currently. Um, admittedly, we're on a short space of time, but there should be some good themes coming through for you. Um, you're going to be able to demonstrate how to use an easy to use toolkit of tools and techniques that you can use anytime, any place and anywhere. So everything with me is very practical. I call it lift and shift. So you should be able to pick it up straight away and be able to use it. And also, hopefully today, you'll be able to some, create some ideas of what you can use individually in every part of your life and every day of your life. So um, I don't know if anybody is aware of Mental Health First Aid UK. I'm a mental health first aider myself. And back in March, they brought out um, my whole self. So how do you bring your whole self to work? And I think that's quite a good analogy. You know, it's very difficult to separate work from home, certainly when we're often working in our homes now, um, as much as we are in our you know, general work environment. And then also, hopefully through today, you'll start thinking about how you can create ideas of how you can train your staff to use, um, you know, to create a more resilient workforce. So there'll be some, you know, some tools and techniques. And then Joe very kindly will send you out some um, information afterwards with um, a couple of the tools and techniques that you could use straight away in a team meeting or um, just generally with your team. OK, let's get started. Um, any questions before we start, though? Feel free to use the chat box at any time. Joe is monitoring it and um, she, will, she will shout out to me because I just get super excited and just carry on. So if there is anything in the chat box, feel free to type things in and Joe will uh, let me know accordingly. So your first question, and actually this is for you to put some scores in the chat box, please, if you want to. Um, I would like to know today, how much energy have you got out of 10? So have you been up this morning, take the dog for a walk, put something in the slow cooker, or literally dragged yourself to your desk saying, oh my God, it's still only Thursday. So how much energy have you got out of 10? The second one is how receptive are you to being here with me, Joe, and all of these other lovely people and taking part um, this lunchtime? And the third one is how present are you without anything else on your mind apart from being here? So you just be completely honest with me. You can't offend me, honestly. So just type in your three scores and then Joe will shout out a few for me. Thank you. 
There's a few people put about energy first, Debbie. That's fine. Seven, seven is the average. That's not bad for a Thursday, is it? I'll take, I'll take a seven on a Thursday. I think that's pretty good. John's put eight. Whoa. Chioma's put eight. Lovely. Francesca's okay. a six. Yeah. Getting tired towards the end of the week. It's all, it's, it's inevitable sometimes, isn't it? So what about the receptive and the present, Joe? Um, receptive, um, I've got an eight, a seven, a present, I've got a three. Present yeah. or John's, John Sage. Thanks, John. I was emailing John last night. John's present is nine. Excellent. Um, Claire's a uh, receptive is seven. Sorry, these are all a bit skew with now. Yeah. Don't Present worry, but we're getting some we're getting some variance then, Joe, on the on the um receptive. Yeah. So in the nicest possible way, I couldn't give a monkey so much energy you've got, and I don't really care how receptive you are, because that is my job in the next 45 minutes to keep you online. But the one that concerns me the most is present. So what we do is we harp on about the past. 300 years ago on a Tuesday, we used to do it like this. And then we do this might happen, that might happen. And nine times out of 10, it never actually happens. So the best place to be is here in the present. Because if I said to you, what can you do with what is on your mind right at this moment? The answer is this, absolutely nothing. So you 100% choose where you put your mind. Don't get me wrong. I've got 32 things on my to-do list. And if I allow my brain to uh, switch over to that, I will dilute my quality, which I'm not prepared to do. So for this, you know, this session, I am 100% present. And these are some of the tools and techniques that I'm going to show you that will help you on your path to be more present, which helps with the thinking and the online thinking. Because we all have online and offline thinking, and I want to put you towards more online thinking. Okay. So any, any thoughts on that? Anybody want to shout out? What are you thinking about energy receptive present? Okay, we will move on. So that is something I use every day. So whether I'm about to switch on my computer or I'm going to walk over the threshold of where I'm training or facilitating that day, that determines what kind of day I'm going to have. So it's really important to know where we are, to know where, you know, where our energy is. So particularly like this one. So I imagine I have a number of leaders here today people that lead other people and are very much around, I'll help you out, I'll sort you out, I can do that for you. But for me, it's about who puts on their oxygen mask first. You cannot help others, you know, you know, really well if you are not resilient yourself. So for me, it's about the number one person to look after first is yourself. Whereas actually, generally, if we have people from HR or leadership here, we are generally fixers. So we like to fix everything. Whereas actually we can't fix things proficiently unless we look after ourselves first. So when we look at it, you know, what is resilience? Um, loads of different, you know, quotes and, uh, you know, and definitions that you'll get, but the ability to adapt well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, and from sources of stress, such as work pressures, health, family or relationship problems. So for me, I look at us all um, pretty much as we're all Marvel superheroes. So uh, we have this little suit, this Teflon suit, we wear this Teflon suit and every, you know, when we're online and everything's going okay, literally things just bounce off of the suit. But every now and then it turns to Velcro and then one thing sticks and another thing sticks and our resilience goes down. So it's not about cheerleader pom-poms and everything's fluffy and, you know, and great, which is just not realistic, but it's about knowing when you're wearing that suit, what is it looking like? Is there a few holes in it? Is it working? And also working out what are your sources of stress or pressure? So pressure is absolutely normal, um, but it's a different level of pressure that we can all take. So every single one of us here can take a different level of pressure it's when pressure becomes too much that it becomes stress. So it's working out different levels of pressure. And often we find this, don't we? Certainly um, from an HR perspective around, um, you know, why is this person not working as hard as this person? Or, or I'm working harder than that person. Everybody takes a different level of pressure. So it's working out um, how resilient we are. Um, and there's loads of different factors to that. So what I want you to do um, in a moment is the question I'm asking you is, 
where are you in the here and now on a Thursday at 12.42? So if you think about it in relation to these little factors here, so what is happening currently for you? Work, family, finance, health and life events. Now, I'm not going to ask you anything personally on these, but what I'd like you to do is just take literally two minutes, maybe write those five headings down and just write out what is currently happening for you. So is work good or bad? Are family well or not well? What are the what are your finances like? What's your health like at the moment? What life events are being thrown in your path at the moment? So just take a couple of minutes. Okay, we're just coming up to two minutes. Isn't it amazing how quick two minutes can go? So you probably only just started probably on work, to be fair. You may have started touching on family, but this will be a good exercise to do post this session to start working out what are your sources of where your pressure is. Um, and we'll talk about how you can control what, what you can control and what you can't control as well. So that's you know an area for you to, to think about and have a little look at. But actually, what we've got to remember is how much change we've been through. So I am sure that probably a lot of you are very aware of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross change curve. This is the Debbie Stanford adapted version. Um, so if you think back to 2020, when the um, pandemic started, so January 2020 pandemic, really in China, that sounds bad. It was probably, you know, shock that there is this pandemic. And then denial, beginning of March 2020, we still can do what we, we need to do. Nothing, you know, too much to worry about. You think there was still racing going on, football, concerts and so forth. And then by the end of March 2020, not going out to work in the traditional sense, only allowed out once a day, difficulty getting shopping. I'm sure we all remember toilet roll gate, pasta gate and so forth. Um, and then we went down to the sadness and low mood, you know, when um, we had that consistent five o'clock um, briefing of number of deaths reported and the impact it was having on ourselves and our loved ones. And then we started to experiment online working bit strange, but nice to see people, or only some of us physically at work. And then decision, new ways of working, getting used to the new normal. And then hopefully most of us are in the integrated, you know, adaptable and flexible foundry groove, no things may change, happy to adapt and thrive. You know, let's be honest, how many of us don't like sitting in our office with our slippers on and our Zoom top on, you know? It's not a bad thing sometimes, it's flexible working, it can't, it's not always a bad thing. However, Let's move it on to 2022. 20, and then September 22, the shock element, pandemic subsides, but the cost of living crisis, political turmoil and war. Denial, we'll get through it, it won't be that bad. And then frustration, October 22, the bills start coming in, trying to cut back, reduce social life. And then the sadness, low mood, not being able to do as much as you want, living through winter with media bombardment. And then going back into the office more, Possibly. I think we might see an up an, an uprise in this from you know, uh, information that I'm reading at the moment. Reducing heating, consciously looking at ways to save money. And then decision, new ways of socialising, working and living. And then again, going back to that integrated, adaptable, flexible, found your groove, no things may change, happy to adapt and thrive. But actually, we're probably in the washing machine, which is down at the bottom between frustration, sadness and experiment. And some people might just still be in denial you know, the first few bills haven't come through yet and so forth. So if we're talking about our whole self, we cannot underestimate what people's resilience will be like over the coming year to two years with what is going on outside of work. Because there's, there's no two ways about it. It will affect how they're working inside of work and all of us with, um, you know, buildings and how much it's costing to run our buildings um, and so forth. So definitely thinking about where people are. And I also think, you know, it's, it's a good question to ask, you know, where are you on there? People on the left need lots and lots and lots of communication. 
people on the right are more of the champions towards it. So you will have, you know, the yin and yang at the moment of the people where it's very much they can't see past it at the moment. And there'll be other people like, it'll be all right. We'll sort ourselves out. It'll be OK. Don't worry about it. So trying to make sure we know where people are to be able to support them in the um, in their, you know, in the right way. But um, somebody sent me this the other day, um, a fellow coach um, saying about actually it does come down to a lot around mood. Um, and the mood pyramid, you know, if we think back to Maslow, we all know Maslow probably inside out, back to front. But I quite like the mood pyramid as an alternative, you know, time to recharge as much as needed. And that could be somebody just taking five minutes out at work, you know, not necessarily having to have hours, but just having that breathing space, you know, time with loved ones and sunlight, many servings per day. I don't know about you here in Chichester, the blue sky is just starting to come out. And that sun is, you know, that daylight you know middle of the day been proven to be the best time to be out this time of year trying to encourage people to go out at lunchtime um some form of movement a couple of servings a day meaningful projects a few servings a day and fun at least one serving a day um i was asking a group the other day when was the last time you laughed and some people couldn't remember which i thought was really sad so very much around thinking about the mood and where people are um, and seeing where they are with those those situations um, this is an exercise that um, I'd like to give to you. Um, I recently did this uh, as a resilience session with um, our local hospice, with the ward staff and the community teams um, who've been through hell and back over the last two years, to be fair. Um, if anybody's resilient, these guys are. They're amazing. But this exercise that we did was around control, influence and accept. And we had three flips up. Um, and it was all around the workplace. So nothing to do with home in this instance, but what can we control? What can we influence and what can we accept? Because quite often morale goes down when thinking goes offline. And what it is, it's trying to get people's thinking back online to think, actually, what is it you control? And a lot of the things that were coming up were mood, behavior, relationships, um, you know, the fundamental things that we need as part of a team to make it work. And actually, the influence was much wider than they ever anticipated. So they might not be um, the decision makers, the strategy makers, but actually they do have influence over what can actually happen and how they actually do that. Um, and they can influence others by their own moods and behavior as well. Um, and that was a big one. You know, we've all got um, mood hoovers fun sponges, fun suckers, be careful with the last one. Um, you know, we've got them everywhere in a workplace um, and how we influence our, you know, others' behaviour through our own. And also the big one, what do we actually have to accept? So there'll be things that we cannot change that actually we do have to accept. And um, often this is quite a, uh, can be quite a controversial exercise, but can also be quite cathartic um, and also give areas of focus afterwards as well. So something you can do personally, but something that you could do, um, you know, as part of a team as well. Is there any questions anybody would like to ask about that one? No? Okay. Feel free if there is anything, type it in the chat box and Joe can throw it at me at um, any particular point. De uh, Debbie, yeah. um, Henna has asked if, I think it's going back to the previous slide, yeah. if you can elaborate about life events. Life events. So are we talking about this one, Helen, or are we talking about this one? No, further back. So when you gave us the four items that you need to think about, and yes. like, yeah, yeah, I understand what life events are, but you know, in this context, did you mean something specific or just life events? Just just life events per se, Helen. I would say okay. because, um, for me, it could be um, they could be they also could be life events in work, as it were, as well. So some okay. people don't different, differentiate between them. That's why I always say work and life events to try and give them that differentiation between work and home. Okay, perfect. That, that's that's, that's what I thought, and I was like, "Is it referring Thank to this particular thing?" Thank, Thank you, you for asking. Um, so let's go. Let's move on to um, this. You know, so this is a lovely little one you can have in your back pocket as a tool and technique that you can use. Um, but for me. Um, Everybody loves a bit of Covey, and if you don't, I think you're quite strange. Um, so Covey, for me, around the, you know, getting control, circle of control, circle of influence, and circle of concern. People spend a lot of time worrying about things that they cannot control. So for me, this is another little exercise. Um, 
and that you'll get this um, you know, sent to you, as it were, um, from Joe with the um, information afterwards. So identifying the cause, doc, you know, document what is actually having an impact on you. Then start analysing the cause, investigate the level of control you have in each cause. And step three, putting first things first. You know, you can draw, get people to draw this on a piece of paper or you can obviously download this, uh, you know, this particular diagram. No control goes in the outer circle of concern. Could influence goes into the middle circle of influence and can control goes into the circle of control. So step four of taking control, let go of all the issues in the outside circle. If you have no control over them, you know, if you had 10 people in your team and they all spent five, you know, I don't know, half an hour a day moaning, very low, I know, five hours a day, 25 hours a week, 100 hours a month, can you afford that? No, we need to have these conversations. So it's about letting go of all of the outside issues in the outside circle, taking each cause in the middle circle and writing down the action they can take and then reviewing the middle circle and identifying what you need to do to influence the outcome. So I, I, there, is, there is something for me around this particular time. Yes, it's about us supporting others, but it's also about them taking accountability. So they need to take accountability for where they are and what they need to do as well. Of course we can support, but it has to, it has to have some of that internal desire, that intrinsic motivation. So there's another little, another little one that you can use and also you can use with your teams um, and people that you're working with. So if you're a facilitator, what a great one to use at the moment if you're going out doing anything on resilience or change or anything around that. So um, but what it all comes down to is this is where it all starts for me, really. Um, and I'm sure a number of you know NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. So in Debbie Stanford's speak, fancy pants words for why we get on with some and why we don't get on with others and why we think, act and feel the way we do. So there would have been a time in your career where you have driven into the car park at work and thought, oh, my God, that person's car's in. Or call a display comes up and it's their number and you think, oh, man. Or they walk past and they breathe and it's too much. So we've probably all got to that particular point with somebody um, at some point. But what it is, is understanding why we get on with some people and why we don't get on with others and how we can control our mind. So everybody's got a map of the world and the map of the world is the way you see things. So I look out the window here and thankfully I can see blue sky, a few little white fluffy clouds. Um, and it all looks quite nice out there this afternoon, to be fair. But wherever you are in the UK or the world, um, you might be seeing um, a different, you know, a different view out of your window. Neither is right or wrong. What we see is different, and that is absolutely fine. So what happens first of all is that our brain filters billions of bits of information per minute, and most of it we are completely unaware of. So if I said to you, keep your gaze exactly where it is now, can you see something colourful out the corner of your eye? The answer is probably yes. Because uh, if you're anything like me, I surround myself with loads of colourful things to uh, keep me entertained while I'm working. Um, and if I said to you, what can you hear? You might say, well, I can hear you, Debbie. Um, but you might be able to hear a dog barking, somebody go, you know, walking, walking around, uh, car reversing, whatever it might be. All of that was there before, but you filter it in and out. But the first thing that creates this map of the world is your belief system. So from the moment you were born to the moment we sit together now, you have a set of beliefs about what you believe is right, what you believe is wrong, what you like, what you dislike. Is that fair to say for everybody? Yeah, we've all got those. However, around the age of seven or eight, we have something inbuilt in us, which are our core beliefs. So um, I'm, I'm reckoning we're probably quite similar, hopefully. Uh, and there'll be things like stand in line, wait your turn, don't push in, be nice to others, say please and thank you. So when people go against these, get a little bit twitchy. So what happens is our beliefs create our state of mind that come out in our body. So if you think about somebody you really, really, really dislike, are your maps similar? No. But if you think about somebody you really, really like or even love, are your maps similar? And the answer is probably yes, but you know, I wish they put their pants in the in the wash bin and stack the dishwasher properly. Um, but generally what happens is we gravitate towards people that have a similar belief system to us and we repel against people that don't. And certainly in a work environment, that's not available to us. We need to be able to get on with everybody. We don't need to love them. 
we need to be able to get on with everybody and it's understanding around you know our are, are people's maps and are, is their thinking online or offline and then that's how we then deal with that person and how we deal with ourselves. so imagine your map of the world is i'm gonna have a smashing day at work today absolutely love my job good at my job think it's great really believe in it your state of mind is online and your physiology is you're either a little bit pumped up or you're quite relaxed one of your staff members is not having the best time and their map of the world is oh crying out loud it's only thursday got another day to go in this place yet and their belief is i'll just do the bare minimum da, 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 da. and their state of mind is what we call offline and their physiology is just like well okay whatever so we need to understand why that person is in that space and not necessarily be annoyed by the action so what we often do is because it doesn't match our map of the world we immediately say that they are wrong so what it is, it's about taking that different perspective to understand why they're coming from that point of view. Um, and don't get me wrong, I teach this over one, two or three days. So we're just getting the surface, but hopefully that gives you the idea um, around what that means. But if we take it a stage further, what's real to you and me goes through um, the filters in our brain, creates our map of the world, creates our state of mind, and it comes out in our physiology. Now, you'll probably see some arrows going the other way physiology, state of mind, map of the world. So have any of you ever had to have a tricky conversation with somebody at work and you felt it either in your throat, your chest, your stomach or the back of your legs? Give me a nod if that's the case. Yeah, those feelings haven't come from any of those places. They've come from in here. And what you've done is you've hardwired in when this happens, I behave like this. So I'll give you a prime example. My wonderful late parents were Olympic world champions at shouting. They could shout for everybody. They were very good at it. But so for a number of years, whenever anybody shouted, I would literally recoil. You wouldn't see me externally do it, but internally I would do that. And what I've done over the years is I've rewired. If you want to shout, crack on. So don't get me wrong. I'd get that initial, oh, it's a bit of a shock. But literally after a while, you know, after a short while, my heart rate won't change. And I will literally think, right, OK, let them let them do whatever they need to do. And then I'll be, are you OK? Do you need anything? Well, I'm not going to just calm down, calm down, sit down. What do you think you're doing? Because that person's expressing themselves and that is how they are in that particular moment. But your behaviour, I don't need to absorb it. I can watch it. I can identify it. I can work with you, but I don't need to absorb it. So your behaviour belongs to you. It doesn't belong to me. So when you say you make me feel like that, you feel like that because there's a mismatch in the maps. I punched him on the nose because he annoyed me. I hope I never hear you say that. But, you know, it, you punched him on the nose because there's a mismatch in the maps and didn't control the situation. So we're constantly trying to clone people to think the way that we think. And it's a, you're fighting a losing battle, I'm afraid to say. Because how it actually works is your thoughts create your mood, which come out in your body. So you are responsible for everything you think, say and do. Nobody else is. I'm going to give you another little tool here. This is probably one of my favourites. Um, now, this, don't need you to give me a story. I just want you to type in the chat box. OK, what's the worst you've ever felt in a work situation? Zero. It didn't bother you. Hundred. It really bothered you. Type in the chat box. Let's hear a few scores. Oh, lots of hundreds there, Debbie. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, not brilliant, but brilliant for this for this particular exercise. Let's just point that out. So what I'd like you to do, lovely people, is draw that line on a piece of paper in front of you and do zero one end and 100 the other. OK. And then what I want you to do is I want you to write these words either end. Zero next to zero, broken plate. So that is broken plate. And next to 100, I'd like you to write the word bereavement. OK, so zero is a broken plate, something you can sweep up and you can put in the bin. Up to bereavement, somebody close to you dying, one of the worst things that happens in our lifetime. Where would you put that work based situation now? Please type in the chat box.
What are we getting, Joe? A few 70s, mm -hmm. couple of 80s. Yeah. Okay. We're starting to let go. If I was with you all day, I would get you to a, a zero or 10 at the maximum. There's because a 50, a 35 come through. Yeah. So what's happened is people are starting to do this and we call it drop the pen. So when you can drop the emotion attached to an issue, you can deal with anything. But what happens is this kind of thing happens. And we need to be able to reset. So imagine this morning you go to um, turn your mobile off by the side of your bed and you knock a glass of water over your phone. Oh, my God, my phone or words to that effect. Then you go to get out of bed. You wrap your foot around the lamp. The lamp smashes on the floor. Oh, you go downstairs. You open up the bread bin. Somebody's taken the last two pieces of bread so you can't have any toast for breakfast. And then you drive to work. You park in the car park under the tree where the birds poop and you cleaned your car yesterday. And then somebody opens up the door and goes, morning, how are you? And you go, well, you won't believe the day I've had. But on a scale of zero to 100, they are all very, very small. But what we tend to do is we are not resetting. So something, if we take a phone call in the morning, puts us in, you know, a bit of a wrong frame of mind, not quite offline, but not, you know, not quite there, we're at 30. Something else happens, we haven't reset, we're at 50. You know, by the time we get home, we're probably 90 and we open up the door and go, who's left their shoes in the hole? Or whatever we might say. Because often it's the people at home that get the worst of us because we're not resetting. So actually, for me, that zero to 100 is a life tool. So everything that happens on a scale of zero to 100, I'm not thinking it's life or death, but I'm just thinking on the scale of it, how important is this? But you can see very quickly where the pace of life and where we've got back to doing everything very, very quickly, that we are not resetting. And for me, it's great when I go into organisations and I've taught this tool and people I go, where are we today then? They go, oh, I was at 75 yesterday, Debbie, and I know I shouldn't have been at 75 and I know what I needed to do. I just let everything go and get on top of me. And you go to somebody else, Zen like today, Debbie, I am on a 10. And you think, brilliant, this is where we want to be. These are the kind of tools that we need to start using and be using. Um, so, yeah, really, really interesting, that one for me. Um, and, yeah, just think about how you use it, but we need to reset. So, as I said, your thoughts create your mood, which come out in your body. So if you want to, if you go back to that scale, if you're above 30 regularly, it's having an impact on your health. So it's a great tool to start measuring kind of like where you are with your resilience and also a team tool that you can use that once you've taught them how it works, um, asking where people are. So I'm just going to bring in the chimp. I'm sure a number of you have used chimp brain before. Um, Professor Steve Peters, you know, was the psychologist, of the Olympic cycle team, worked with loads of people in sport and business. Very clever guy. Took the parts of the brain, split them into three and said, what you've got in there is you've got a human, a computer and a chimp. So the computer is your storage area. Everything you've known from the moment you're born to the moment we sit together now. So your maps in there, how you tie your shoelaces, make a cup of tea, put your pants on, whatever it is stored in that computer. And the human is you in your logical sense. So what you often hope is your human and computer come together and you say lovely things. But let's get back with the program. The first part of your brain that works is here. It's the chimp. It's the emotional thinking machine. And it is five times stronger than the human. So as soon as it feels under threat, people are likely to let their chimp out unless they can control that behaviour. Interestingly, so Chris Hoy in one of his forwards of uh, one of um, Steve Peters' books said he wouldn't have won his gold medals without him. So it just goes to show you, you might have the physicality, but actually it's having that mental capacity to like move forward that makes a difference. So I'm going to prove to you all that you've all let your chimp out. OK, sounds a bit saucy when you say it out loud, but I'm going to prove to you you've all let your chimp out. So um, imagine it's a beautiful sunny day. Um, it is um, your day off. You're going to nip to the supermarket. You're going to get something nice to eat and something nice to drink for your tea. You drive round and round and round. There are no spaces. So you go up the lane with the arrow facing this way and you stop. And you just turn your engine off. And then sure as eggs are eggs, a couple of minutes later, somebody comes out with their keys. Woohoo! just going, and you think, oh, brilliant. So you start your engine, they reverse out this way, and somebody comes in the other way and takes the space. What might I hear you saying or doing, or should we not really repeat that on a lunch and learn session? 
but I'm sure we'd hear some expletives, some hand gestures um, and so forth. And yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever else you might do, to be fair. Um, but this happened for Bournemouth in real life. The guy that didn't get the space went over to the guy that got the space, dragged him out of his car um, and he died of a heart attack in front of his wife. And that is just instant chimp brain because when you look at it logically, um, two questions the guy didn't ask were, can I know it to be true? Can I 100% know it to be true that this guy's taken the space? But what is screaming in his brain is the core belief, stand in line, wait your turn, don't push in. But on a scale of zero to 100, how important is the space? And that's where we've got to get better perspective. We've got to be more online to make better decisions. Because what's going to happen if more and more of our workforce start going offline, we are going to get more people off sick, which is going to cost them their health and also cost us in our organisation. So you can see how quickly things manifest, you know, went from zero to 100 literally in the you know, split second. But what we do need to do is we need to get ourselves to at least here. You know, your chimp is always simmering about here. It's ready to pop out at any moment. So. You know, when you combine your chimp and your map, you've got some powerful tools to start using. You know, the chimp brain explained the human is you. It's all about logical thinking and working with facts and truths. The computer automatically functions. It's a reference source for information, beliefs and values. And the chimp is the emotional thinking machine. It works with feelings and impressions. So one of the big lines that I use on virtually every session that I ever deliver is and certainly with coaching, when I'm coaching somebody, you go, oh, I don't think I can do that. I feel it's not for me. Think and feel are not real. Do you know you can't do that? It's very different to, I feel I can't do that. Do you 100% know you can't do that? And then the question starts. So what's stopping you? How can you do that? What will that look like? What could be your first step? So very interesting, you know, the chimp works, you know, so listening out for people as well. If they're saying a lot of think and feel, not saying people shouldn't think and feel, but it's probably more of a, uh, a chimp response than it is probably a human response. So making sure that you're listening and listening out for that to hear that. Because the modes of chimp aren't always like angry chimp, uh, of like the one we've just heard. You could be freeze, you know, a bit shaggy and scooby. Uh, you could be flight, you know, running away from it. You could be fight, Saturday night's all right for fighting. Or fold, just want to literally curl up in the corner. So chimp doesn't necessarily have to be that bold, outright, you know, thumping on the chest kind of chimp. We can see different modes of how it actually works. Um, so moving on from this one, let's look at our next slide. Okay. Decides it's going to have a little funny five minutes, which is always good. Remember, when you arm wrestle your chimp, it is five times stronger than you as a human. So would you, you know, would you physically go and, you know, arm wrestle a chimp? Of course you wouldn't. But metaphorically, you're willing to give it a go. So if I said to you, you know, at nine o'clock this morning, uh, would you like to carry me round on your back? I think it'd probably last about 30 seconds. But we're willing to carry all these people. Um, with their chimps and so forth, instead of maybe having those conversations. Really, really interesting. So, how it works. If you want to have a real clear vision of how chimp and human works, an event happens and we interpret it. As a chimp, we work in feelings and impressions, we have emotional thinking, and then we usually come up with a terrible plan of action. And then when you think about it, as a human, we work with facts and truths and logical thinking, and often we come up with a better plan of action. So for me, it's very interesting around when you try and, you know, NLP third person technique, draw yourself up, look down on the situation. Is that person in human or are they in chimp? Are you in human or are you in chimp? I'm very much working out where you are and, you know, where you want your resilience to be in relation to that. So just gonna give you literally uh, about a minute or so. Um, what triggers your chimp? So maybe you want to type in the chat box, what triggers your chimp? That might be quite interesting. Or any answers to any of those questions? You've got one, two, three, four, and five there. So if you're going to make an answer in the chat box, write one, two, three, or five, and just throw out a few answers for Joe and I to um, you know, look at. That would be brilliant. What triggers your chimp? I know, I know what triggers mine. Thomas has put a comment to say that, um, I think this is when you're on the previous slide, you just yeah. described what's 
uh, called Quiet Crit- Quitting. Yes, yes, very much so. So some answers to question one so far. Um, yeah. Anne's put hunger. Yes. <laughs> My daughter would agree with that. Um, Nikki has put rudeness. Yes. Um, Asher, um, when they're being ignored. Yeah. Um, Heen has put uh, assumptions. John's, I, I could agree with this one. John's put technology failures. Um, Kareem's put unfairness and a lack of integrity. John's yeah. put unfairness as well. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So it's it's recognising in those situations about is it unfair or is it what we believe to be unfairness? Um, and it's knowing if it's going to trigger you, how you react to that. So, you know, often the first thing that people do is just walk away or move away from the situation, but it's not a long-term solution. It comes back to the, the toothache analogy at the beginning. That's a short-term situation. It's knowing how to control your chimp. And that is something that I talk about and do a lot of delivery around um, in, the, in my sessions. But yeah, very interesting. And also probably um, I remember going to um, Steve Peters um, uh, Chimp Brain Management um, Conference up in Telford a few years ago and uh, saying about you should give your chimp a name. So be careful who you teach it to. My kids came into the office with the picture of the PG Tips monkeys from the 70s with the pink dress and the band. And above it, they wrote Lola. They went, that's just in case you ever let your chimp out, mum, your chimp's called Lola. So uh, maybe it'd be quite handy for you to think about giving your chimp a name today. Um, this, this, uh, it's quite an interesting analogy. So where do you want to be? We started of like, where are you and where do you want to be? Um, and I'm interested to know what are you going to do now? So what, which tools and techniques will you use? What are you going to take action on straight away and what areas may take more time? So this is an individual exercise for you. But what I'd love you to do is pop in the chat box now which tools and techniques you think you might use from today. Or shout out if you want a little chat, shout out whichever way you want to do it. Which ones do you think are going to be useful? Nikki's put use the scale and reset. Lovely. Hold on, there's a lot of flashing up and I can't read them quick enough. Uh, Claire's put the note to 100. Excellent. Good one. Um, Kioma's put the, the, the same, the scale. Yeah. Helen's put the broken plate to the bereavement scale. Yeah. Debbie's also put the scale. Anne's put the scale on the chimp. Yeah. Um, Kareem, remembering in the moment, I can choose how I respond. That's a good one. Very, very true. We don't think about it at the time, but the aftermath is often not pleasant when we haven't done that. Um, Ash has put the scale and reset. John's put the scale and the chimp paradox. Suzanne's put the same scale and reset. Yeah. That's where we're up to now. Brilliant. Lovely. So there's some great stuff there that you can use personally, but you can also use if you're a facilitator or if you are a leader and you want to use some, you know, get some tools going with your team. So just to wrap up um, in this very short space of time, um, just to let you know what I offer, I offer one-to-one -one coaching sessions, face-to-face, -face, online, telephone, and this afternoon, I am walking coaching. So um, being, you know, if you, if you want to look at my um, walking coaching website, it's fairly new. I've been doing it for about 10 years, but everybody seems to think it's quite niche. So um, it's strideforsuccess.co.uk. So if you want to have a little look at that, that's quite interesting. Um, I do team coaching sessions, team workshops, organisational workshops, train the train programmes on resilience and how you can then deliver it in your own organisation and building resilience, you know, ongoing programmes. So lots of different stuff around that. Um, and just some testimonials from some building resilience courses. Um, I found this on the back of the loo door when I went to one of my organizations around what testimonials that people have put on about why they, you know, why it's good to come on it. You know, brilliant course. I suggest everyone should attend. Very relaxing and made total sense. I've managed to remain calm by using techniques in the training, really engaging session with useful material for home and work, putting work and life pressure into perspective. So this is just one, one, uh, just one client that I work with. We started off with just doing a very few people and then everybody in the whole organisation came on the training, which is fabulous. It was great. Um, and it's become part of their language. Um, everything I deliver, though, is bespoke, just to let you know that. So that is, uh, so whatever your issues and challenges are, it will be tailored towards that. So, um, you know, without going into too much detail, a call to action for all you guys. Um, if you're struggling to identify your root causes um, to purpose um, and your resilience, 
Um, then this is your opportunity to take action. If you want to type yes in the chat box, if you'd like to contact me to contact you for a free half hour chat over the next week, um, offer finishes 31st of October at midday. Um, just feel free to put yes in the chat box and um, I'll be happy to have a little chat with you and just see where you are, see if I can help you with anything. So um, any questions? Any questions from you lovely people? And thanks for sticking with it. And I didn't do breakout rooms because I thought I might lose you all. So <laughs> thank you very, thank you very much for all sticking with it. Um, anything that anybody wants to ask or or say? I can't believe all these HR people and all these people on here that nobody's got anything to say. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, and thank you so much, really good. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you perfectly, Corinne. Perfect. Um, I think these um, the, the sort of tools that you talked about and the complete mindset stuff is so transferable to stress management, yes. to anger management. Um, it's just Mediation. really good. Exactly yeah. so. And, and I work, I do some work as a mediator and, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So I can see how these are so easily transferable across. Yeah. So great life skills. Thank you so much. Absolute pleasure. And I just like people to go away and use them. You know, I'm not precious about anything. Um, I think the more that we can start changing mindset, the better people will be. And it's going to be a really challenging two years. So, you know, in the nicest possible way, people will invest in lots of other things, but it's about investing in people to think online. Mm. Mm. Um, to keep people you know keep people where we need them to be and that's not just from a business perspective but that's just being you know generally a nice person you know? we want to keep people where they need to be yeah. and I did put in the chat is it possible to have a copy of the slides yeah of course I'll get them sent to I'll get them sent to Joe and then you can I can yeah, I'll pdf them so they can come over to you no problem at all and if you thank want to you. chat about any of it just feel free to give me a shout Okay, thank you so much. Pleasure. Good luck with them all. Very good session, Debbie. Really enjoyed it. Uh, yes. Just a quick thing, you know, when you talk about the map of the world, you know, our yeah. mental map of the world. Yeah. And this has happened to me like just two weeks ago. And uh, somebody said that, what if your mental map is cute because of the way you've been brought up? And this came in, 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 in a session with BNI yeah. Council. And it was a really interesting question because I is a very interesting not, question. But think about these things, right? When I think of mental map, I think about the values which are universal. Yeah. But while values are universal, lived experiences are different. So yes. how, how does that play out? I, it's I just really, wanted to get some perspective. It's really, you. really interesting. So without sounding flippant, obviously most things will come from what we, you know, what we learned as a child, but some of the beliefs we had as a child, we don't have now. So in the nicest possible way, you don't want to disillusion any of you, but Santa's not real. Neither is the tooth fairy or the Easter bunny. So some of these beliefs we can eradicate, but it's what how you rewire it. And it's, it takes time, but it's using, I don't know if any give me like tiny, tiny, tiny techniques today, but it's using all of those to build, to say, you know, like through coaching as well of like, why, why do you believe that? What does that give you? Is that useful? Mm -hmm. How's that serving you at this precise moment? Give me an example of when that's been, been good. And what it is, it's trying to take yourself out from things that have been so inbuilt mm -hmm. and saying, you know, lots of things that we did as a child don't serve us well now. But what we do is we hang on to things that we had as a child that won't serve us. So it's trying, yeah. So it's trying to use, it's trying to change those to rewire to think mm -hmm. differently. Okay, now another question, and this is my own personal experience. So what? I, and this is sorry about my personal family example. You know, obviously what? my mental map of the world is different from my granny's mental map of the world. Of course, some of the things that she does, I think, is completely unacceptable in today's time in the world. Yes. Right? completely unacceptable yes but my affection for her is so much that yes even despite trying to change I can't change I, I just know and probably I'm even concerned because she's my granny I wouldn't be concerned if it was somebody else I'm like you know what be on your journey all of us have our own journey yeah. to deal with but how do you um I have this in yes. my own family um <laughs> my, my beliefs can be very different to some of my own family and what it is is I will maintain the affection, but what I, I won't be drawn into things that I don't agree with. Mm -hmm. so what I say is I hear what you're saying, but I'm not, I don't want to talk about that. Or that, no, I, I see that from a different perspective. I think it's best we don't talk about that. 
but it's being brave to have those conversations. So, and I'm I'm quite open. And if if it doesn't, if I don't want to talk about it or I don't agree with it, I say I see where you're coming from. I see it from a completely different perspective. I appreciate your perspective, but I won't change your mind. And it's being honest, but it's not about having to raise your voice or be difficult. It's just saying those honest conversations. But the more we don't, the more it festers. And you think, God, if they say that one more time, I want to punch them on the nose. Whereas actually, it's around, I don't want to get involved in that conversation. I'm just glad I'm not the only one who's suffering. No, (laughs) I think everybody around here will say there's somebody where you think, oh, my God, here they come. And, and there's immense affection, that. right? There's immense affection. I love my granny too. Of bits, course. But some of the things that comes out of her mouth, I'm like... Really? I know. But we can't change. We can't change anybody else's thoughts. We can only change our own. So all the time, I remember meeting my husband 30 years ago, and the first thing his mother said to me was, you're going to need to change him. And I went, no, I like him the way he is. And people's mental map is they need to be like this. Nobody needs to be like anything. So you choose where you want to be and accept people where they are. Thank you. Okay. Pleasure. Any others? No. John's shaking his head. John's saying, I really want my lunch. Shut up, Debbie. Move on. (laughs) (laughs) That's absolutely fine. Um, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me today. Um, And I hope to see you in the future. And if you need anything, just drop me a line. Thanks, Take care. Take care. Take care. See you later.